Chapter 7 of The Airlords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Captured. Certainly my situation was no less desperate. Unless I could find some method of compensating for my lost ballast, the inverse gravity of my inertron ship would hurl me continuously upward until I shot forth from the last air layer into space. I thought of jumping and floating down on my inertron belt, but I was already too high for this. The air was too rarefied to permit breathing outside, though my little air compressors were automatically maintaining the proper density within the shell. If I could compress a sufficiently large quantity of air inside the ship, I would add to its weight, but there seemed little chance that I would myself be able to withstand sufficient compression. I thought of releasing my inertron belt, but doubted whether this would be enough. Besides, I might need the belt badly if I did find some method of bringing the little ship down, and it came too fast. At last, a plan came into my half-numbed brain that had some promise of success, though it was desperate enough. Cutting one of the hose pipes on my air compressor and grasping it between my lips, I set to work to saw off the heads of the rivets that held the entire nose section of the swooper, inertron plates had to be grooved and riveted together, since the substance was impervious to heat and could not be welded. Desperately I sawed, hammered and chiseled, until at last, with a wrench and a snap, the plate broke away. The released nose of the ship shot upward. The rest began to drop with me. How fast I dropped, I do not know, for my instruments went with the nose. Half fainting, I grimly clenched the rubber hose between my teeth, while the little compressor carried on nobly, despite the wrecked condition of the ship, giving me just enough air to keep my lungs from collapsing. At last I shot through a cloud layer, and a long time afterward it seemed another. From the way in which they flashed up to meet me, and to appear away above me, I must have been dropping like a stone. At last I tried the rocket motor, very gently, to check my fall. The swooper was, of course, dropping tail first, and I had to be careful lest it turn over with a sharp blast from the motor and dump me out. Passing through the third layer of clouds, I saw the earth beneath me. Then I jumped, pulling myself up through the ragged opening, and leaping upward while the remains of my ship shot away below me. On approaching the ground, I opened my chute cape to further check my fall, and landed lightly, with no further mishap, whereupon I promptly threw myself down and slept, so exhausted was I with my experience. It was not until the next morning that I awoke and gazed about me. I had come down in mountainous country. My intention was to get my bearing by tuning in headquarters with my ultraphone, but to my dismay, I found the little battery discs had been torn from the ear flaps of my helmet, though my chest disc transmitter was still in place, and so far as I could see in working order. I could report my experience, but could receive no reply. I spent a half hour repeating my story and explanation on the headquarters channel, then once more surveyed my surroundings, trying to determine in which direction I had better leap. Then there came a stab of pain on the top of my head, and I dropped unconscious. I regained consciousness to find myself, much to my surprise, a prisoner in the hands of a foot detachment of some thirty Hans. My surprise was a double one. First, that they had not killed me instantly. Second, that a detachment of them should be roaming this wild country afoot, obviously far from any of their cities, and with no ship hanging in the sky above them. As I sat up, their officer grunted with satisfaction and growled a guttural command. I was seized and pulled roughly to my feet by four soldiers, and hustled along with the party into a wooded ravine, through which we climbed sharply upward. I surmised, correctly as it turned out, that some projectile had grazed my head, and I was in such shape that if it had not been for the fact that my inertron belt bore most of my weight, they would have had to carry me. But as it was, I made out well, and at the end of an hour's climb was beginning to feel like myself again though the Han soldiers around me were puffing and drooping as men will, no matter how healthy, when they are totally unaccustomed to physical effort. At length the party halted for a rest. I observed them curiously. Except for a few brief exciting moments at the time of our air raid on the intelligence office in New York, I had seen no living specimens of this yellow race at close quarters. 
They looked little like the Mongolians of the 20th century, except for their slant eyes and round heads. The characteristic of the high cheekbones appeared to have been bred out of them, as were those of the relatively short legs and the muddy yellow skin. To call them yellow was more figurative than literal. Their skins were whiter than those of our own weather-tanned forest men. Nevertheless, their pigmentation was peculiar, and what there was of it looked more like a pale orange tint than the ruddiness of the Caucasian. They were well-formed, but rather undersized and soft-looking, small-muscled and smooth-skinned like young girls. Their features were finely chiseled, eyes beady, and nose slightly aquiline. They were uniformed, not in close-fitting green or other shades of protective coloring, such as the unobtrusive gray of the Jersey beaches or the leaden russet of the autumn uniforms of our people. Instead, they wore loose-fitting jackets of some silky material and loose knee pants. This particular command had been equipped with form-molded boots of some material that reached above the knee under their pants. They wore circular hats with small crowns and wide rims. Their loose jackets were belted at the waist, and they carried for weapons each man a knife, a short double-edged sword, and what I took to be a form of magazine rocket gun. It was a rather bulky affair, short-barreled and with a pistol grip. It was obviously intended to be fired either from the waist position or from some sort of support, like the old machine guns. It looked, in fact, like a rather small edition of the 20th century arm. And have I mentioned the color of their uniforms? Their circular hats and pants were a bright yellow, their coats a flaming scarlet. What targets they were! I must have chuckled audibly at the thought, for their commander, who was seated on a folding stool one of his men had placed for him, glanced in my direction, and at his arrogant gesture of command, I was prodded to my feet, with my hands still bound, as they had been from the moment I recovered consciousness, I was dragged before him. Then I knew what it was about these Hans that kept me in a turmoil of irritation. It was their sardonic, mocking, cruel smiles, smiles which left their stamp on their faces even in repose. Now the commander was smiling tauntingly at me. When he spoke, it was in my own language. So, he sneered, you beasts have learned to laugh. You have gotten out of control in the last year or so. But that shall be remedied. In the meantime, a simple little surgical operation would make your smile a permanent one, reaching from ear to ear. But there, my orders are to deliver you and your equipment, all of we have of it, intact. The heaven-born has had a whim. And who, I asked, is this heaven-born? San Lan, he replied, misbegotten spawn of the late high priestess Nlu Mok, and now most glorious air lord of all the Hans. He rolled out these titles with a bow of exaggerated respect toward the West, and in a tone of mockery. Those of his men who were near enough to hear snickered and giggled. I was to learn that this amazing attitude of his was typical rather than exceptional. Strange as it may seem, no Han rendered any respect to another, nor expected it in return. That is, not genuine respect. Their discipline was rigid and cold-bloodedly heartless. The most elaborate courtesies were demanded and accorded among equals, and from inferiors to superiors but such was the intelligence and moral degradation of this remarkable race that every one of them recognized these courtesies for what they were. They must of necessity have been hollow mockeries. They took pleasure in forcing one another to go through with them, each trying to outdo the other in cynical, sardonic thrusts, clothed in the most meticulously ceremonious courtesy. As a matter of fact, my captor, by this crude reference to the origin of his ruler, was merely proving himself a crude fellow, guilty of a vulgarity rather than of a treasonable or disrespectful remark. An officer of higher rank and better breeding would have managed a clever innuendo, less direct, but equally plain. I was about to ask him what part of the country we were in and where I was to be taken, when one of his men came running to him with a little portable electronophone, which he placed before him with much bowing and scraping. He conversed through this for a while, and then condescended to give me the information that a ship would soon be above us, and that I was to be transferred to it. In telling me this, he managed to convey, with crude attempts at mock courtesy, that he and his men would feel relieved to be rid of me as a menace to health and sanitation, and would take exquisite joy in inflicting me upon the crew of the ship. End of chapter 7